Well, good morning. It's a good way to chart, start church. Does that look like your life? <laughs> you know, there's sometimes in life where we can't control things. And the best thing you can do sometimes is let go. And uh, that's when you have teenagers too, by the way. Uh, you know, sometimes you're better just to recognize that you can't control it. I'll talk about that in a second. But first, I wanted to let you know, I went ahead and I told you I was going to do it. So I entered into chat GPT and I wrote things a pastor... I, first, I typed things a pastor shouldn't say. You do not want that list. It's awful. So I'm not going to read that one. So second, I said... Because, by the way, if you didn't know this, the chat GPT is the computer that will just talk to you about stuff. And it's dumb, just so you know. There'll be a day that it's smarter than we are, and it'll take over the world. If you've seen iRobot, that's going to happen. But, uh, but in the meantime, it's cute. So I wrote jokes, a pastor might say. So here's what you get. Where's Dave? Because he's going to love these. All right, here we go. Why did the choir cross the road to get to the other verse? Yeah. Yep. You know you're getting old when you stoop to tie your shoelaces and wonder what else you can do while you're down there. I thought this one was really good. I think this is original. Remember, God's timing is perfect except when you're waiting for a parking spot at church. Why did Noah have to discipline the animals on the ark? Because they were acting wild. I told you, Dave would love these. They say laughter is the best medicine, but I still recommend a balanced diet. I asked congregants if they knew any Bible jokes, and they replied, nah, they're all too Old Testament for me. Remember, humor can be subjective, and what's funny to one person might not be to another. It's important for pastors to gauge their congregation's sense of humor and cultural context to ensure that their jokes are well-received and appropriate for the setting. Dave, well-received. I told everybody today in Sunday school a joke that I thought they had heard before. A couple, Thelma and Louise, off of a cliff and went to heaven. And when they got there, the husband was showing, uh, Gabriel came and was showing the husband and wife around heaven. And they walked around heaven. They were having a great time. And all of a sudden, the husband says, I am so mad at you. And she said, why are you mad at me? He said, if we hadn't been eating all that fiber, we would have been here years ago. Let me ask you this question today. What if, when life gets out of control, you could suddenly have peace? How would your life be different? Today we're going to talk about learning to let go, and I want to tell you a story about when I surf. By the way, surf ministry right back here. Y'all raise your hands, Beth. You guys say hi, and uh, you want to see them after the service. They're going to have this surfboard very soon, because I'm giving it to them after this service to use, and uh, they said I could borrow it from them anytime. Um, but, uh, when I was in college, I used to surf and one time me, uh, and a couple of friends, one named Andrew went out surfing, uh, as a tropical storm went by. And if you've ever surfed when a tropical storm went by, let me just encourage you never to do that. But we did. And I did not have a foam surfboard. I had a fiberglass surfboard. And what I like to tell people is I outgrew that surfboard. All right. So. Uh, so now I have this giant surfboard, which basically you can just get on it anywhere and get anywhere. So we were out surfing, and I uh, got hit by some white water, and I jumped up on the board, and I was riding the wave and realized that my friend was right in front of me. Now what I should have done is just jumped off the board, and the wind probably would have grabbed the board and took it in the air. But instead, I thought, I'm going to turn this board so I don't hit him. So I jumped off the board and grabbed the board to turn it. And as I did, I literally turned it with my weight behind it right into Andrew's head and instantly hit him right in the middle of his head and blackened both eyes instantly. He went for weeks as raccoon boy at school. All because I didn't let go. And too many times in life, we're like that pilot, like, like Neil Armstrong in that video. I'm trying to make this, speaking of letting go. We're like that pilot, but we refuse to give up. And there's times. <laughs> let it go, let it go. 
I'm going to do a sermon on how to do, what to do when you get a billion dollars. Today we're going to talk about things we lose, though. We all have times in life that the truth is we have to learn to live with loss. And some of that's more difficult than other times. If we lose somebody we love. But Paul in Philippians chapter 3 talks about things that you and I need to learn how to lose. And so I want to talk about those three things today. So number one, losing self-righteousness. Paul starts with this idea. And here's what he says. Watch out, oh, excuse me, excuse me. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage. By the way, that's probably the, one of the strongest verses in the New Testament. If you take a Greek class, Greek teachers love to talk about this verse for ever because it's the closest to cussing that seminary professors get to be. It's true. It's absolutely true. And so Paul is using this, this really bad word here. I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ. Yes, I want to know the power of his resurrection and participate in his sufferings, becoming like him in death, and so somehow attaining the resurrection from the dead. And so Paul starts out this chapter talking about, hey, listen, I, if you want to be proud of the law, I did all the law. If you want to be proud of being a Jew, I was the Jew of all Jews. I was the head, he was the Michael Jordan. I mean, he did everything right. He had all the rings. He had all the victories. Paul knew where he was headed. And then one day on a road to Emmaus, Jesus shows up, blinds him by the light, and says, you're persecuting me. You think you're doing my will, but you're really doing your will. If you're here today, the truth is, if you think you're going to earn God's love, you're going to be exhausted. I would even go this far. If you think you're going to earn someone else's love, you're going to be exhausted. If you think you're going to control other people, <clears throat> Marcus, for example, he's in my Sunday school class, so I pick at him. If, if you think you're going to control other people, you're going to be exhausted, right, Carol? She's like, yeah, I got Bill, I got you, right? <laughs> the truth is, when you try to control other people, you're exhausted and all of us, if we're honest, sometimes when we try to, you ready? Control ourselves. I'm telling you, if you today decided I will never eat a Girl Scout cookie again and you wrote it down on your way home, as soon as you get home, the Girl Scouts are giving away cookies in your neighborhood. Whatever your favorite is, right? That's just, that's just how life is. And so when you try to earn your way to God, when you try to earn satisfaction, when you try to control things, sometimes it's just exhausting. And some of you grew up in a home where if you didn't do what was just right, that you weren't loved. That, that you never measured up. That your parents, if you did one thing, they said, well, we'll jump a little higher. Do a little more. And they were never quite satisfied. And you in your mind think that's how God is. And Paul thought that too. And he said, I did all this stuff. He said, now you got this whole group telling you, you got to do all this stuff in order to make God happy. And the truth is, what I want to know is not all that stuff. All that stuff I did is garbage. What I want now is to know him. To have a relationship with him. To surrender to him. See, because the truth is, when you give your life to Christ, you are justified by faith. He sees you as righteous. He can't love you anymore. If you're one of these people who, like Martin Luther, when you sin and you mess up, you think, well, God's going to punish me today. And you're going up steps on your knees, bleeding and hitting yourself in the back saying, hey, I got to earn my way back to God. You don't understand God's grace and his forgiveness. The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful 
and just and will forgive us our sins. If you're beating yourself up over your past, if you're beating yourself up because you don't have it all together, then you're looking the wrong way. Paul said, it's not about me. It's not about my works. It's not about the things I do. It's about knowing him. When's the last time that you got still and you just said, God, thank you that you love me. Because what's amazing about God is, you ready for this? He knows every thought you've ever had. He knows every mistake you've ever made. And yet he absolutely loves you. You don't deserve it. And when you recognize, God, I don't deserve your love, but you give it to me, you know what happens? It begins to change you. Because you realize that you're not earning your way to his acceptance. You're not earning your way to his approval. You're not working your way to heaven. You're just surrendering to know him. And when you understand how much he loves you and you surrender to knowing him, it begins to change you. You only find yourself in losing yourself to Christ. You know, we're in a society that continually talks about finding themselves. And it sounds like the 60s, by the way, again. Right? People are finding themselves. They're wearing silk shirts again. What's that about? But anyway, right? They're not wearing deodorant. It's the same thing. It's the 60s all over again, right? So, did I? Wow, that was, that was out loud. Did you hear that response? And, but, but the truth is that people are trying to find themselves. That's not really what they're finding. They're looking for happiness in all the wrong places. They think they're going to find it somewhere. They think they're going to find it through their identity. If they have the right pronoun in front of their name, maybe my pronoun is wrong. I'd rather be an adjective, by the way. I want to be Super Eric. I want, I want everyone to have to call me Super Eric. Is that not okay? Is that... I want to be a pronoun? Sorry, I had to answer that question yesterday for a, for a, a survey. I said, what's your pronoun? I'm like, I want to be an adjective. I don't want to be a pronoun. Super Eric. Galatians 3.11 says this. Clearly, no one who relies on the law is justified before God because the righteous will live by faith. What does that mean? You're never going to measure up. You know, it doesn't mean that you just give up because you're never going to measure up. But here's the deal. When you recognize, I will never measure up, so I have to surrender. I will never measure up, so I have to let go of me trying to do it. If I take this surfboard out on a lake, it's now a paddleboard. I can paddle around as much as I want. I will never catch a wave. And some people are like that in their Christian faith. They're working and working and working and working and they've never gotten on a wave. We're just waiting to say, God, you're moving. I need to get in on what you're doing. We'll talk about that in a second. Number two, losing the past. What's your past like? You ever have regrets? You ever think you wish you hadn't done or said? Things you wish you could go back. By the way, one thing I've learned about the past is every time I replay it, it's the same tape. And the more you play it and play it and play it, you're just depressing yourself. Sometimes you just have to say, God, you know I did that. You know I said that. You know this happened. I know you've forgiven me. Lord, help me to walk in your forgiveness. You have to let the past be past. Hey, don't you think Paul, now that he's sitting in jail, had time to think about his past? The Christians that he had killed. Some of these people he was writing, he might have persecuted their families. We don't know. Don't you think he had some regrets? And yet he said, I, I'm putting the past in the back. Listen to what he says. Not that I've already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took a hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I don't consider myself to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining towards what's ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ. And so even though we've been sanctified by Christ, or excuse me, glorified, <laughs> now I got the words all mixed up, hang on, let my brain catch up with my mouth. We've been justified through Christ, but that doesn't mean that we don't now need to be sanctified. 
which means that we understand that we mess up and blow it, but it doesn't mean that we say, well, I'm just going to do whatever I want and be a Christian. I'm just going to do whatever I want. I guess I'm messed up anyway, so I might as well do whatever I want. Well, I would say, and Paul would say, and John would say, are you sure that you're a Christian? Because the truth is, when you surrender your life to Christ and you recognize what he's done for you, it begins to change you and you begin to say, God, how can I now get in on what you want me to do? But too many people, when they read this verse, think, well, that means works. Well, here's what it means. If you're out on a nice day, and you guys have been out on clear days where the waves are like butter, and you got a nice clear set coming in, First of all, you've got to line up with that wave. And I would say for all of us, we've got to line up with what God wants us to do. If you want to pursue what God's best is in your life, you've got to line up with what he wants first. And then, guess what? Before the wave gets there, you know what you've got to do if you're on a surfboard? Keith, what do you got to do? You've got to paddle. You've got to start paddling. Why? Because you're getting ready to catch a wave, but you can't catch it if you're not prepared for it. For some of us, the way that we need to prepare is to spend time in prayer. For some of us, the way, for all of us, the way we need to prepare is to spend time in God's Word. God, I want to line up with what you want. And then guess what happens? God's the one doing the work. You're, you're going with Him. You're working towards what He wants. But guess what? That pressing towards the goal is only possible with the power of the Holy Spirit in your life. The only way you change, the only way that you give up your anger while driving, the only way that you talk kinder to that person that you struggle with, the only way you can forgive that person that did that horrible thing to you or to somebody you love, the only way you can walk in that is if you get in on what God's doing and allow His Holy Spirit to. To push you along. That's what Paul's talking about here. He's like, I know it's not a justification by my works, but at the same time, God, I want to get in on what you're doing in my life through the power of your Holy Spirit, not by my works, but by your strength. And so that's what he's doing here. He's, he's pushing towards what's ahead. So when's the last time you surrendered to what God wants to do in your life? Or are you still paddling? <laughs> Are you working so hard trying to get your life straightened out that, that you're not paying attention to what God's even doing around you? When's the last time you said, God, you know what I figured out? I can't do it on my own. By the way, I think sometimes the Holy Spirit says to me, finally. Every once in a while I'll do a project at the house and I'll work on something. Not too long ago it was a lawnmower. I'm working on something and it breaks worse. I'll never forget one day I had to replace a light in my car and I went to replace the light and I watched a YouTube video and it said, take the bumper off. So I took the bumper off. I couldn't get the bumper back on. And I called a guy from our church and he said, YouTube is my favorite client. And he, guess what he did? He said, I was just waiting for you to call me when I heard you telling that story on Sunday. It took him five minutes to get that thing back on. I could almost hear him go, finally. And the Holy Spirit sometimes in our life is the same way. We're trying, we're working, we're trying to talk the right way to people. We're trying to do the right thing. We're, we're, we're trying to, to drive more like a Christian. We're, we're trying to talk to that person. We're trying to forgive that person. We're doing all this stuff. And then we go, I just can't do it. And God goes, finally. Finally. I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. Not through your own strength. Not through your own power. In Galatians 2.20 it says, I've been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. Doesn't that sound like riding a wave? The life I now live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. By the way, if you wonder why we do so many surf illustrations, if you haven't noticed the name of our church, you might want to look outside on your way out the door. I love what Clovis Chapel says. God owns it all. He owns me. He owns my home. He owns my children. He owns my property. I've called your attention to the fact that the modern idea of ownership is pagan. The Christian idea is this. God is the absolute owner of all things. So this week when I was out of town and I get a phone call, the church is flooded again. And I had just written this sermon. I 
I, I can't do a thing about it. You ever had those moments where you just you can't do anything about it? it God, I just I surrender. God, I can't fix it. God, I can do some things. I texted some people. I called some people. But all I can do is paddle a little bit and say, God, it's yours. Is there anything in your life today that you have to say, God, it's yours? You've been worried about it. You've been fretting about it. You've been frustrated about it. You've been following it. You've been trying to please that person. You've been trying to control that person. You've been trying to fix that person. And maybe it's time to quit doing all of that and just say, you know what, God? I, I'm not able to do... It's getting worse when I touch it. By the way, come to my house. I'll show you my lawnmower. It's about 12 parts now. It was two. And you say, God, I surrender... I live by faith. So we lose self-righteousness. We lose our past. Number three, we lose control. Mm. For as I've often told you, Paul continues in verse 18, before and now tell you again, even with tears. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Time out. I got to tell you this. So this week we dropped at least, by the way, my sweet wife is here right here. If you haven't met my sweet wife. If you want to meet her, you come find her because she's... Somebody will grab her. And... So we dropped our sweet daughter off at USF this week. And I just knew Kristen was going to be the one. And I was going to be fine. And then Elise hugged me. And they looked at me. I said, quit looking at me. Go over there. I cried like a baby. I'm like, dang it. I didn't plan on that. I like to control what happens. Every once in a while, somebody will say to me, Eric, you said you don't like to be in front of people. I say, no, 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 you don't understand. I don't like to be in front of people unless I'm in charge. So in Rotary, they sing happy birthday to me, and I'm like, oh, please don't do that. I hate that. I don't, because I'm not in charge of that. See, this, I get to let you out when I want. So if you're wishing you were up here. So Paul continues, so first he's talking to these people called the Judaizers who said you had to become a Jew to become a Christian, and now he starts dealing with this group called the Gnostics, which I don't have time to go into all the deal, but the Gnostics were basically, if it feels good, do it, people. That's kind of a summary, it's a short summary, but that's really what they were. And so Paul goes from dealing with these people who said it's all the law to the people who love their stomachs. All right, here we go. He says, their destiny is destruct. He said, for as I've told you before, I'll tell you again with tears. Many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And their glory is their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await a savior from there. The Lord Jesus Christ, who by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so they will be like his glorious body. That's glorification. The future is that God's going to take care of us. That's the hope of heaven. That's the hope we have when we have a funeral service. God, I, I, all pain will be taken away. All the noise I make when I bend over to tie my shoes won't be there anymore. All the things, all the hurt, all the baggage, all the mistakes won't be there anymore. And yet we live, you ready for this? I got to rent a car a few weeks ago. When you rent a car, it's awesome. I hit a curb, I heard it, and I went, well, too bad. I came out to the car, somebody had yanked part of the handle off. It was missing. Well, I thought it's a long story, but, and I had bought the insurance. So I was like, oh, well, no big deal. Took it back to them, handed them the keys. This is broken, but I got the insurance. Here you go. The guy's like, okay, see you later. I'm like, ah, yeah, it's yours. Don't look at the rim. Too many of us live in this life like we own it. See, when I own a car, guess what? You might get it detailed. If you rent a car from somebody and you take it to a detail shop, you are crazy. Why would you do that? You don't own it. And yet, many of us spend so much time worried about everything on this earth. 
Where am I going to go? What am I going to do? How am I going to retire? What's going to happen next week? What's going to be due? And what about this? And what about our government? And what about that government? And what about this government? And what do I have to fear this week for the news tells me? What, what do I got to be mad about this week because the news told me to be mad about it? What, you know, what, what's my list? You're just renting here. Quit polishing the rental car. Now, I'm not saying to not take care of yourself. Please take care of yourself. We, want you, we don't want you to get to heaven and God go, what are you doing here so early? But at the same time, we worry about all the wrong things instead of looking at eternity and realizing that God's got this. So you don't have to worry so much about the temporary things. You ever hit a curb? God forgives. God renews. God sanctifies. He's working on you. In Romans 12, 1, it says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to do what? To offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do you want to relax? Begin trusting God with your life. One of my favorite counselors was on a plane last week, and he said he was next to a guy, and the guy said, Well, since you're a counselor, I've got to tell you something. I don't trust anybody. Now, they were 10,000 feet in the air at the time. And this counselor looked at him and went, um, well, apparently you trust this pilot and you trusted the guys who fixed the engines and you trusted the guys who put the tires on and, you, and he went through a whole list and he said, you trust people, you just don't trust the right people. And I would say to you, you're trusting somebody today. It might be you. It might be somebody else, but I want to encourage you, if you want to be able to rest and ride the wave that God has for you, to learn to do what Paul said and make everything about knowing Christ, surrendering all those things you're worried about to him and saying, God, whatever you want me to do, I'll do. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to be a Christian, to really surrender your life to him. The Christian life is one word, surrender. God, I surrender my life to you. And he takes your sin and gives you his righteousness. When you understand that he died on a cross to pay for your sin and he rose again and you surrender your life to him, that's what he does. If you want to talk about that after the service, I'll be here. If you're here today and you're a Christian, and as I talked about worry or talked about your struggle, you thought of something, well, that's your confession today. So just confess it to God. Ask Him to give you strength through His Spirit to walk through that, and He will. We're going to have a prayer now. We're going to have our time of giving, and you give what God's put on your heart today. Have a closing song, and then if you need prayer, I'll be here after the service. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for this time today. I thank you for your word. Lord, we don't like to lose control. We don't like to give up. We don't like to surrender to you, but that's what we need to do. So we choose today to surrender all things to you. Lord, if there's anything in our life that we're holding on to tightly, Lord, would you right now just make it clear to our hearts through your spirit so that we could surrender it to you? Lord, we do that now in Jesus' name. Amen.